Hey guys, it's Shaylin, and I'm here today with another episode of Recent Reads. This is the series where I just chat about the last 10 books that I read. I read a lot of books, and I like to just take the time to reflect on what I read, and also, like, recommend books, because I love recommending books to people. If I seem a little loopy in this video, it's because I just filmed another Recent Reads, because I'm very behind on filming these videos. But we're finally catching up. I think we're into books that I read in, like, February at this point, rather than the last video, which was books I read in, like, December. I am not rating these books on a scientific rubric. It is a weird combination of my personal enjoyment versus my assessment of the craft, but even that is very, very subjective. I don't have, like, a consistent way that I rate books. It's certainly not a scientific formula. For me, a book that I just love and holds my attention from first to last sentence, that is a five-star read. None of these books, no book, in fact, other than I guess my book that I'm writing, is written to cater to me for the purpose of me to enjoy it. Me not loving a book doesn't say that, hey, this book's not valuable, or hey, you won't like it, or hey, you shouldn't read it. It's just for me talking about how I personally felt and why I personally felt that way, not which books are objectively good and objectively bad and which ones have contributed to the betterment of society and which ones should be burnt. So the first book that I read is one that I'm so excited to talk about. It's Pizza Girl by Jean Kyung Fraser. This is one of those books that's been on my radar forever, and it's one of those books in the category of why did no one tell me this was gay? This book follows an 18-year-old pizza girl who is pregnant. She lives with her mom and her kind of doofusy boyfriend, but she ends up delivering a pizza to a mom who wants a very specific pizza for her eight-year-old son. She ends up becoming like obsessed with this woman named Jenny and continually visiting her as she delivers more pizzas and de developing this like sort of obsession and infatuation with her. To me this was like sapphic Otessa Moshvig vibes almost. The voice is very sardonic and gritty. It captures kind of both the exhaustion and effervescence of real life. In kind of a Moshfegian way, it's so realistic that it almost becomes surreal. Like it's so hyper specifically weird that it becomes almost unreal in how real it is. It's not as extreme or as off-putting as a lot of the detail in Otessa Moshfeg's work, but that sardonic grittiness reminded me of her voice. The voice is really funny, clever, but there's a sadness underneath. There's a tangible yearning underneath the characters are really interesting, the relationships are really interesting. I thought the relationship between the narrator and Jenny was really interesting. She had really interesting relationships with her boyfriend, with her mother. Really interesting relationship with grief happening here, kind of in the background, but in a palpable way as well. The one thing I was craving was a little more escalation and depth to the Jenny and narrator relationship development, which throughout the middle does escalate and develop very, very quickly. And I think I just would have liked a few more key beats there because that was the heart of the story. I just felt like we did miss a little bit of the escalation in the middle there. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. It's one of those books that's been on my radar forever and I'm glad that I finally picked it up. So then I read All the Lovers in the Night by Miyako Kawakami, translated by Sam Bett and David Boyd. So this book follows a very lonely woman named Fuyuko who works as a copy editor. She's extremely isolated, she's extremely lonely. She loves going for walks on Christmas Eve to just look at the kind of the lights, kind of her one like source of joy, but she ends up meeting this man who is a physics professor and they start kind of kindling a relationship. I think this is one of those books where the way that people talk about it felt different from, from how I experienced it. A lot of people talk about this book as having a dreamy, like, dreamy quality, but also being extremely sad. And, like, it is sad. It's not that this wasn't dreamy, poetic, and tender, but I just didn't feel like it was as dreamy, poetic, and tender as I feel like the way that people tend to talk about it. I felt like there was actually not much heat happening at a lot of points that I think it could have been developed a little more. I think the way the author writes about mundanity in a way that feels, like, real but also the grinding was poignant and quite truthful. I just wasn't as impacted by this as a lot of people seem to be. Maybe it's just because I've read a lot of like sad lonely girl books. I think this one just maybe didn't push the concept in a way that impacted me. I don't know. I just don't think I got as much from this, from the character's journey as I think a lot of people seem to. So I don't know what I'm missing here. Maybe it's just because I feel like I've read a lot of books this type of book before. I love a sad lonely girl book and so maybe I just need a little more from that concept at this point. Then I read At Certain Points We Touch by Lauren John Joseph. So this book follows the narrator who I believe is unnamed and her relationship with 
this man that she's had an ongoing affair with, but we learned in the beginning that he's dead. This like web of relationships that she has through like the queer community, she's trans. Many messy, toxic, compelling relationships, a very compelling main character. My first note here was messy, toxic relationships, a compelling main character, impeccable writing, queer people. Why didn't I love this? The main thing is just that this was very meandering. And long. I don't mind plotless. It's kind of plotless and dense, not plotless and quick. Very meandering to the point that it lacked like movement and I just felt like so many scenes were very long and very repetitive, like the same kind of scene over and over, to the point that it got a little draining to read. Even though conceptually, character-wise and writing-wise, very well crafted, very well put together, and a lot of very interesting things happening on the page and a lot of themes that I find very interesting. I just stylistically am not a huge fan of work that is both dense and slow. It can be slow if it's not dense, and it can be dense if it's not slow, but I'm not a fan of slow and dense. I think I just needed a bit of a stronger sense of cohesion to fuel this because it just started to feel like I was kind of reading the same scene over and over at a certain point through the middle there. On the line level, really beautiful. The characters are very interesting and the web of relationships is very complex, which I do love. This is kind of my era of like 3.5. Like I feel like most of the books in this video, I'm like, this was pretty good. Reading a lot of books where I was like, this is a good book, but I didn't love it. But then I read Cairo Circles by Doma Mahmood. This book follows a web of connected characters who are all Egyptian youth, either growing up in Cairo or one of the main characters. He lives in New York, he is arrested after a terrorist attack and he's like this is so messed up i literally was at home sleeping and then it turns out that it was his cousin and he's like oh my god and so he ends up being thrown into this like media whirlwind i thought that that storyline shiro his storyline was so engaging he was a really interesting character his voice was so close and interesting the storyline was very compelling he was caught in this like web of media attention that is like just making him spiral. But the other POVs were all pretty distant and a little aimless to me. Like I think I would have adored this if it had just been his his story because I thought that that was the most interesting. Everything does tie together in the end, but it also means that Shiro's point of view was kind of dropped at the last second. I feel like the ending still could have been accomplished without spreading the story so thin. I just felt like the story was spread a little too thin over so many characters. And these other characters, the voice was not as interesting. The voice was almost a bit factual and removed and I couldn't really connect to those characters. But Shiro's voice was so engaging and close and he was a really interesting character who you could both really sympathize with and at the same time recognize how he was making really bad choices. Very interesting, messy character. I think this would have been a knockout of the park if it had been solely his narrative, but the other storylines were kind of slow and a bit uninteresting to me because the voice was so distant. I get why for the ending there were all these different storylines, but I think the overall impact on the novel that that had for me was one that made it feel like I was wading through a lot of stuff just to get back to this one storyline that was to me the heart of the story. I can't really say anything about the other characters because the story was so distant from them as we were learning about them. We, it was weird, it was like I was reading two completely different voices. These, this third distant third voice that didn't really give me much and then Shiro's really close voice that was really immersive. So then I read How to Set a Fire and Why by Jesse Ball. This was another book that I read as a potential comp for the novel that I'm writing. Um, the main character, Lucia, is like 15, I think. Her dad's dead, her mom is in a psych ward, and so she lives with her aunt. At the beginning, she begins at a new school, but she ends up joining this secret arson club and becoming very obsessed with fires. Very interesting voice. Like, Lucia is a, a very interesting balance of passionate and apathetic, cynical and realistic, open-minded and young. The way the voice is structured just makes the, it seem so voicey. Like, we know that she is writing this down. It feels incredibly voicey and true to a teenager. There's some events that happen in this book that are just not unpacked and they really should have been. So like there's a, this scene where she's visiting her mom in a psych hospital and she ends up wandering off and having sex with an orderly who works there. And it's implied that this is like her first sexual experience. Her mom literally witnesses this happen, like makes eye contact with her mom. And this is never discussed again. 
I'm like, why was this in the story? Did she really have no zero feelings about this whatsoever? Given the circumstances, I just feel like there would be a lot to unpack there. And but there it wasn't it didn't even come up again. So I'm like, why was this in the story at all? So many aspects of the story were so true to a 14 year old girl, girl's narrative. But then like in the voice and the way she thought, but then sometimes things would happen in the story that I'm like, why was this there if it wasn't going to be talked about? So then I read Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. So this is a dual narrative that follows Miriam Graves, who is an aspiring pilot. We follow her actually beginning with her mother and then all the way through her life, basically all the way through childhood. She dreams of becoming a pilot. We know from the storyline happening in the fictive present, which follows a kind of child pop star now entering adulthood named Hadley, who ends up playing Miriam in a film. And we know that Miriam ended up getting lost and dying on one of her voyages. Very interesting contrast happening between these stories. There's this historical storyline about Miriam fighting tooth and nail to become a pilot. And then we see Hadley in the present in this very modern voice where she's kind of like a child media darling and the intense pressure and scrutiny she's been under has led her to develop a lot of, you know, unhealthy coping mechanisms, but at the same, but then that just leads her to more intense scrutiny. This book has really interesting commentary on like the sacrifices women must, must make for success. Both of these characters have to give up their agency in order to be successful in two very different ways echo each other quite beautifully. There's a very incredibly rich level of detail and incredible writing. I remember reading a short story by Maggie Shipstead and it just reminded me why I really want to read more of her work because she has an incredible eye for detail. The voices are very convincing but completely different. Two completely different worlds and time periods, they both have incredibly convincing rich voices with just many layers of authenticity to them. This is a long book. Some parts start to feel slow and bloated, especially near the start in Miriam's storyline. Hadley's moves quicker because it's first person and we're just seeing her, but there's a lot of context in this book and it, it, there were some points where I was like, I feel like we're getting a little bit more context than we need, all things given, but very, very rich dual storyline that weaves quite beautifully. So then I read Mary Lou is Everywhere by Sarah Elaine Smith. So this book follows Cindy. She lives in a small, in rural Pennsylvania. Her mother is very rarely present. A much more affluent girl goes missing. And so Cindy basically decides to escape, you know, the circumstances of, of poverty and disarray of her life, putting herself into this girl's life and taking advantage of this girl's extremely distraught mother. There's so much impeccably chosen detail and the relationships are really, really weird, which I love. There's just an overall tinge of strangeness to this book that is extremely well maintained through the characters, the style, and the storyline. It's just a very bizarre book with gorgeous, strange, and detailed prose. I just wish the concept was engaged with more. The concept of Cindy escaping her life to take on the life of a girl who's gone missing. There was really only one scene, which mild spoilers, there's a scene where the girl who gone missing, her name is Jude, calls the house and says, help me, this is where I'm being held. And the main character hangs up because she doesn't want her to be rescued because she wants to keep living in her life. That was the one scene where I felt the stakes of the situation were being pushed in a morally complex way that I was in truly so gripped by. The focus of the book is much more on Cindy's family relationships, but this gets quite repetitive. Like we're just kind of seeing the same detail of her family over and over. The actual concept was only engaged with in a very small part of the story. And when it was, it just didn't feel like the tension was being extracted as much as it could have been. I could see a lot of places where the tension could have been pushed a little more, given that there's so much tension possible within this concept. Then I read The Order of the Pure Moon Reflected in Water by Zen Cho. This is a little fantasy novella. There are all these characters. There's a group of bandits and also this character who's a member of this kind of like religious order called the Order of the P Pure Moon. Given how short this book is, there were just too many characters and dynamics for the space. The group of characters must be four or five characters who are traveling together. And so much time is spent on kind of long, inconsequential, but I guess witty passages of dialogue that I felt like we weren't actually getting much of the narrative. The concept, which I explained really badly, but it's just because I don't remember very well, was really interesting. The world was really interesting with really interest, actually interesting world building. And when we do dig into the world, there's some really great conceptual stuff happening and the writing could be really beautiful when it lingered on narrative. When the writing allowed itself to linger on description, it was gorgeous and fluid. 
I just wish there was more narrative, less dialogue, and fewer relationships because it didn't feel like there was enough time on the page to spend on the concept because so much time in this very short piece was spent on very long passages of dialogue that felt inconsequential to me. When this book actually engaged with its concept and allowed itself to linger on the writing, it was quite something special. But as a whole, given how there was too much packed into the book and a lot of it felt like to me, not the best use of space. It unfortunately left me underwhelmed with a book that I think conceptually was fantastic. So then I read Tear by Erica McKean, is a novel about Frances who is about to graduate university. When she starts to have a true mental spiral and she believes that she is locked in the basement. She lives in the basement of this student house and she believes that she is locked in the basement and she can't escape. She believes the door is locked and there's a monster there. This was a very layered story. There's many ideas happening here. I think it's you could reread it and pick up something new on multiple rereads and genuinely creepy. Like the basement section is just hypnotically written. Like all the sections where Frances is locked in the basement and she's trying to escape, it is hypnotizing and unnerving. I wish there was more of that section. Most of the section when she's in the basement is actually dedicated to flashback about her family and her upbringing. I honestly wish there was more basement section because it was so engaging. There are a lot of threads set up. I do wish that more of the threads set up in the first half had been acted upon in like a more visceral way. There's so much flashback and context but it ultimately still felt like that section didn't all like come together in the end. But I did really enjoy this and there's so many interesting ideas going on and really hypnotic writing. I think it is an excellent piece of horror that gives you a lot to, to contemplate as well. Last book is The Sleeping Car Porter by Suzette Mayer. So this book follows Baxter and it's 1929 and he has one of very few jobs that is available to black men at the time which is as a sleeping car porter and he has taken on this job because he is saving up to go to dentistry school that is his dream he is obsessed with teeth and he wants nothing more than to become a dentist over the course of this one trip from i think they leave in ontario or something all the way to vancouver things start to go unhinged he is not really sleeping at all he keeps finding postcards littered throughout the train with these like erotic postcards of gay men he's gay and so he's like it's like are these being left for me he also like can't ignore these postcards um because they touch on like a true desire of his the train ends up getting stuck in the rockies it's a bit of a fever dream the first note was just baxter is a baby boy no he is though like you're just rooting for him so much even when he is in his unhinged era which he is in his unhinged era i'm like he just wants to be gay and become a dentist <laughs> like and it's like such a weird set of traits to give a character. Like they all seem very random. It's like auto-generated. Oh, he wants to go to dentistry school. Um, and he's gay. Um, and he's a sleeping car porter. But it, it all works together to create a very endearing, unique character who is also spiraling. <laughs> There's this very disorienting, cacophonous feeling happening as this sleepless Baxter wanders through the train and has all these weird interactions with all the passengers. Sometimes this was so disorienting that I honestly lost sense of what was tangibly happening and like what was at stake because it was getting like so pushed into the fever dream. The main thing that I, I felt was just the main tension of the story, which is the part where the train is stuck, is actually an extremely brief section of the story that happens very late. That section of the story, I just wish was played out a little more fully because that was like when the tension was so high and I just wish the story had lingered there a little longer. Very unique reading experience. I can't really compare this to anything else. It's one of the most unique reading experiences I've had with how fever dreamy it is. And also this is paired along a character who is like extremely original, whose mental state we're just really fully pulled into in a very visceral, engaging way. That's all for this video. As always, please just let me know what you guys have been reading lately. I would love, to, I always love to hear what you guys have been reading and what you've been loving, especially. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in another video. Bye.